webinar and to organize this. Um, and also to all the participants, of course, which are there. I, I think that probably some um, are still out there and trying to find their way through the door, uh, but will be then with us in a few minutes. Um, you are here in the webinar on line between informal and formal learning. I will uh, spell out the title in a few minutes uh, at a, bit, a, a, bit, a bit more precisely and at length. Um, um, this is taking place, actually, the, the uh, fourth time, the third time, actually, the third year uh, that EDEN, which is a European Distance and E-Learning Network, uh, is uh, ho hosting um, the European Distance uh, Learning Week. Uh, and we do that uh, in cooperation with the United States Distance Learning Association, the USDLA. Have a look if you don't know this organization, very interesting. Also look at the EDEN website if you want to know, know more about the EDEN network, the European Distance and E-Learning Network. It's eden-online.org. Um, and inform yourself about our activities. My name is Ulf Ehlers. I'm a professor for education management and lifelong learning. So I'm an education uh, guy. I'm an education activist, a professor of education. Um, and I have uh, worked my entire professional life uh, dealing with questions of digital learning, e-learning, online learning, internationally, uh, quality management for online learning specifically, uh, and um, then lately as a vice president of my own university for six years, also with the question how actually universities need to develop uh, and to adopt a future model of uh, higher education which will be uh, suitable for preparing graduates. Uh, and in our own research, actually, uh, we did a, a lot of research on what we call future skills or skills in the next society. Uh, and that's very interesting because we are going to organizations and we are asking them, what actually will the future workplace hold? And what are the skills um, um, the future employees are needing? And most organizations tell us the time of knowledge uh, is not over, but uh, seems to be uh, becoming a little bit less relevant next to uh, skills uh, and attitudes, uh, specifically like self-organization. So. It seems that education and professional development uh, of the future and maybe of today as well already has to do a lot with the ability of individuals in the workplace, in society, to educate themselves constantly, lifelong, of course, um, constantly, and the line between those. Um, contexts and scenarios which are formal, uh, which are uh, formal trainings, for example, and those scenarios in which um, uh, ed, uh, in which uh, education takes place in a non-formal, in an informal, maybe even in an incidental way, uh, seems to become more and more important. And of course, now all organizations, all educational organizations, but all other also workplace-related uh, organizations are now challenged because somehow uh, the way we thought about education and training and professional development so far might need to change for the future and need to take into account that no longer a standard formal degree is the only rule of the day, but more and more education seems to be an episodical informal process throughout life. So 
That is what we decided to focus on in this, um, this week, the European Distance uh, Learning Week. Uh, and today, with our webinar, and with that, we greet you all again, also those who have just joined us. Uh, we have with us uh, Irina uh, Vulunevicini. I'm, I'm uh, sorry, but I'm usually only saying Irina. And we have with us Sandra Kuchina Softic. Um, I will introduce you both uh, later on uh, in a bit more detail. We have with us uh, from the uh, uh, Vitatas Magnus University. We have with us um, Alfredo Soera from the University of Porto. We have with us um, uh, Ildiko um, uh, Mazar uh, from KIC, Knowledge Innovation Center from Malta. And we have with us, uh, I hope I pronounce it correctly, Gidre Tamolin from the Vitautas Magnus University to give presentations. Uh, on recognition of valid and open open learning, on um, validation of competencies from virtual, non-formal, or informal learning, um, on credentials, new forms of credentials and credentialing, small micro credentials, and how that can be come reality in the future, and of um, online learners' interactions and engagement into study processes. So um, it is, in a way, um, a whole range of topics which we put onto the stage today, which are dealing with this new form of learning, the line between formal and non-formal learning, formal and informal learning, and how educational concepts can look like, how recognition processes can look like, and how organizations need to react to that. I'm very happy uh, that you experts are all with us, that you all are giving your presentations today. Uh, for the presentations, I have here my uh, watch, my clock, and I will do the timekeeping. Everybody has maximum 15 minutes, 12 to 15 minutes for your presentation. And after that, we are going to have a, a five minute uh, question and answer session. And to all participants, which I again greet very, very warmly here uh, from Germany, where I am sitting today, um, I would like to ask you, already during the presentations, you can uh, type into the chat your questions uh, or also later on ask for the mic. Uh, that's of course possible. So very welcome, very warm welcome to everybody again. And uh, with that, I would like to ask for the first presentation from Irina and from uh, Sandra. Um, I would let, just like to say a few words of introduction. Um, Irina is the president of Eden. So we are very proud to have the president of the European Distance and E-Learning Network in person and live today with us. Irina is the president of Eden. And uh, she is, um, so to speak, at home, the director of innovative studies um, of the Institute of Innovative Studies at Vitautas Magnus University in Lithuania. Um, she has been working, been working in the field very, very uh, many, many years, she has extensive experience in technology enhanced learning. Uh, she is an activist for distance education and for open education. I know her personally as an activist, and I'm very happy to have her here. And Sandra, uh, Sandra is an assistant director for education and user support at the University of Zagreb. So it's a truly international uh, collaboration in this presentation today. Uh, Sandra's work is focused on monitoring and fostering e-learning implementation in higher education institutions which we all know is not easy uh, and is a very challenging um, uh, 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 task to do. Uh, and she has also, of course, uh, extensive uh, appoint, uh, experiences through appointments um, in European uh, working groups, the working group on digital skills uh, and on digital education, uh, learning, teaching, and assessment. And so I 
uh, would like to welcome both of you, Irina and Sandra, and ask you for your presentation. 12 to 15 minutes. Um, keep it short so that we have still some time for questions. Your presentation carries the title Reopen Recognition of Valid and Open Learning Impact and Established Collaboration. So the floor is yours. Thank you very much Ulf, for this kind of presentation. And I must say, your introduction always brings us closer to the audience to start with. So, um, we decided today uh, to talk uh, about the, an international project that is um, just finished uh, five days ago, actually. Uh, but this, this is the result uh, of of the work that has been carried out for two years in the partnership under Erasmus Plus K Activity 2. The project is called Reopen, uh, and the title is visible on the first slide. I give you the link in the chat to, to the website. We decided not to introduce the project and what we did during the project. But to talk about the, the most maybe important thing is the impact that can be reached by uh, uh, such kind of project and established collaboration, not only with formal consortium, but also with other stakeholders and how important they are. Uh, uh, yesterday, uh, during the opening uh, uh, panel uh, on open and distance learning, we heard uh, several very important statements from experts. One of them was that training and uh, specifically uh, bringing and disseminating and, and sharing understanding what the system and innovation is about makes uh, impact. So we skip training, we skip um, uh, understanding and how we build it, uh, but we go uh, to what impact immediately. So we wanted to, to achieve, uh, uh, first of all, six um, indicators uh, demonstrating that this impact is reached, and we will shortly very briefly explain how. So you see here six uh, numbered items, increased sense of initiative and entrepreneurship and professional, professional collaboration. I should add here of all stakeholders involved in the developing the link between formal and non-formal learning. Uh, increased level of digital uh, and other competences of teachers and trainers, and you see three sub-items through developing open learning non-formal curriculum, uh, through applying digital badges to track learning path, and through recognizing open learning in formal curriculum. Third item is uh, to achieve better understanding and um, recognition of skills and qualifications in Europe and beyond. Fourth uh, goes for better understanding of, of interconnections between formal and non-formal education, vocational education, training, and other forms of learning and labor market respectively. Five, uh, towards better understanding of practices, policies, and systems in education and training. And six, more strategic and integrated use of ICT. So, in the reopen project, uh, the first uh, impact uh, achieved, uh, which is namely increased sense of initiative, entrepreneurship, and professional collaboration, was uh, achieved in our estimation uh, by training teachers and trainers who participated in the development of of um, non-formal open courses 
uh, they became emotional owners of the new validated continuous professional development courses and stakeholders in the project result. And they, uh, after they, they developed non-formal courses being a part of formal uh, curriculum providers as well in their organization, they gave testimonies and participating in creating case scenario descriptions. They are all provided online at the project website and we will give to you the link at the end of the presentation. So we think that was a good method to, to achieve the first type of impact. And the second type of impact, uh, which we call increased level of digital and other competencies, and we think this is very important in uh, developing the strategy and the links between formal and non-formal education and transition towards non-formal education and its recognition in in the formal curricula. Uh, we, of course, uh, focus on developing an increasing level of digital and other competencies among teachers. So, again, training, 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 but at the same time, the link uh, of recognition uh, processes and tools should be ensured. So it was very important that uh, in uh, the project, in the open, we, have tra we had teachers trained and we made link uh, among different recognition schemes. Uh, digital badges, paper certificates, Europe, uh, Europe Pass Mobility Certificates, and of course this uh, helped us to link uh, competence a recognition and give evidence uh, on how uh, future learners can also benefit from different schemes of recognition. The third uh, impact, uh, which is better understanding and recognition of skills and qualifications in Europe and beyond, was to use the website as a tool to explain, uh, to first of all, to negotiate and to agree upon the key definition uh, that we use at least for the title of the project and the concept of the project and the idea of the project. So what open learning is, what open and online learning is, what validation is, what recognition is, and what recognition of valid and open learning is. And the, the idea was inspired by Joint Research Center uh, report on uh, validated uh, open mooc based uh, learning uh, in 2016. And, and we kept to the idea explaining on different scenarios, different de definitions, uh, uh, how we can use them in order to create solutions in our organizations that they would be um, for open learning, for open online learning, and for valid open uh, online learning solutions. The fourth impact uh, uh, was to reach better understanding of interconnections between formal and non-formal education, vocational training, and other forms of learning and labor market, respectively. And actually, the target groups in the project already um, brought uh, quite a number of challenges towards consortium members mm -hmm. because the target groups involve CVET, that lifelong learning, higher education institutions, companies. Yes, thank you, Irina. I hope you can hear me. Um, well, um, I was reading uh, again today our training materials uh, to prepare for the webinar, and I, I was again uh, uh, very, very nicely surprised how of how good quality they are, because actually I'm going to talk about the part for the educators. So uh, lots of us are 
involved in producing some learning material modules and courses, uh, whether it's face-to-face -face or online. Uh, so we have a, a, a knowledge. But actually, when to prepare some uh, open online course, uh, you have to know some additional information in order to make it uh, uh, afterwards uh, possible to recognize and validate. And this is why we, in the project, uh, used the system Moodle. And in this system, we prepared uh, the training materials, which I uh, uh, um, invite you all to read and to look uh, at, because they are really good information there. And also, based on these training materials and the uh, templates we prepared, we developed these case studies uh, as an example how can uh, uh, one uh, uh, open online uh, a course look like. Look like. So, um, uh, first, we had uh, the, the course templates where the uh, information about the course uh, 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 is put. And I think it's very important um, to, to, to make this uh, available to participants in order that they know what they are enrolling into. Also, uh, in order to know uh, how, how much time they will have to spend in, in such a course, what is uh, their tasks, uh, what is expected from them, assessment strategy, possibility for certification and credit credentialization, and also um, link to uh, some former curriculum and types of Creative Commons licenses. So um, in order that it's uh, really visible and uh, clear what uh, this course or model is about, there is this template which helps uh, the teacher to prepare the course, but also the learner to be aware, uh, to be aware of uh, all the issues regarding the course before uh, entering to it. Next thing is the learning plan, which I think is very, very important, uh, whether it's mentored course or self-learning course. So in the learning plan, person, uh, the teacher, uh, write information uh, about uh, learning outcomes of the course and the schedule and assignments uh, and topics which are going to be uh, uh, done into, into this course. And you can see it's very important that uh, for assignment it's clear, there are clear guidelines what is um, taken uh, into account and how much weight uh, does uh, special, uh, uh, this, some activities have. In that way, the person have clear understanding what is expected uh, uh, from uh, uh, him or her at what time uh, and uh, uh, what will be uh, the, the final result uh, of their work. Also, uh, the, the third issue is learning agreement, which is uh, uh, very important because when you have these uh, open online courses, um, you uh, often are aware yourself that you start uh, taking some course and drop out or uh, take it, uh, I would say, not so serious. Uh, but with learning agreement, uh, the person um, decides that it's uh, he or she that is taking course, not someone else, and that they understand what is their uh, responsibilities in the course so in order to uh, uh, be uh, uh, successful in uh, uh, taking this course. Uh, so um, there are all other possibilities uh, when you take an online course that uh, someone uh, can verify that it's uh, he or she who is taking the course. But I think uh, taking upon the person to verify that they, took, they have taken this course seriously, that they uh, signed this learning agreement, is very important. Um, and also our outreach is um, more than uh, 1,200 teachers and trainers, as well as employers and education providers, who were reach through our consortium side events with dissemination. Uh, what is very important that the, the teachers and the trainers from consortium gained uh, competencies and skills on developing of these continuous professional development courses and um, that more than 1,000 of potential learners were introduced to them developing, develop, uh, using open, non-formal valid learning solution through our dissemination channels, so like facial, uh, Facebook, social media websites, or LinkedIn. 
Uh, and also we had uh, our newsletter, uh, which we also distributed via our communication channels. Also, uh, I would like to mention as well that we have developed uh, the, the template for the uh, quality assurance of the course uh, for the teachers uh, to check if they have performed everything uh, which is needed for the course, or in, uh, maybe to have some peer reviewing that someone else is checking, uh, evaluation, evaluating this course. So um, I think that this uh, element uh, provided really good uh, base for someone uh, preparing an open online course. And I think that, yes, and the one uh, last thing, uh, ICT platform we have prepared. Uh, it's free for use, so it can be also, uh, that person can uh, take a free copy of this uh, 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 platform. Uh, you can see on our web page there's a, a form you can fill in, and you can have um, uh, this platform with all already all courses and training materials for your use within your institution. Uh, so this uh, exploitation is really, really good because some uh, institutions do not have possibilities uh, to develop their own platforms or prepare their own courses, but they can use already what is existing. Uh, so I'm going back to Arvina. From all these different levels of organizations, because we thought that we must meet the challenge, uh, and uh, we, if we look at the society and how the society is learning nowadays, we we come to need all of these people at the same uh, scale and in the same context. So we thought that it is very important to go for a more complex idea development, and we we think that we actually reached um, this impact as well. Um, we first of all uh, linked every non-formal course developed in the project with a formal curricula in a formal education provider organization and in addition to employer. So we met with employers and discussed how the competences uh, that are gained uh, through the learning in non-formal course can meet the needs of the employer and continuous professional development in that organization. Uh, we use different tools for better understanding of practices, policies, and systems in education and training. So when we had dissemination and multiplier events, every time we brought these tools to, to the target groups, and we uh, saw this. Irina and Sandra, a very, very interesting presentation of a project which um, the results are online available. And as you heard, you can also um, ask for using them in your own university to start open study processes. So very interesting. Thank you. We have a few minutes uh, for questions, if there are any from the floor. Either you type them into the chat, or you ask for the microphone and then ask your question, please. Okay, so far that is not the case. Just waiting for allowing time to ask questions. Meanwhile, I can ask to change the presentations already to the second presentation. If we have no questions, I would like to directly go over to the second presenter, but not without, um, not without thanking again uh, Irina and Sandra for your presentation, which was very clear and uh, very impressive. Uh, for presenting the results of the reopen project. So congratulations for the successful closure of the project uh, and uh, thank you very much.
So we come to our second presenter, which is Alfredo Soero from the University of Porto. He is talking about a very important subject as well. The presentation carries the title Validation of Competencies from Virtual, Non-Formal or Informal Learning Processes. I'm adding a proposal. So we are asked to think together with Alfredo. It is a proposal he is uh, presenting. Uh, and it is on validation of competencies, a very interesting and very much needed um, uh, topic, actually. Um, <clears throat> Alfredo is um, uh, already very, also very connected to the Eden family. He's an Eden senior fellow. Um, he uh, is a, a civil engineer by education. Um, he's an uh, academic director and vice president of civil engineering um, and the pro-rector of uh, University of Porto, the founder of UCAN, uh, of RECLA and of other networks. I think I uh, cannot uh, tell uh, all the uh, different activities and um, initiatives you have actually started. Um, uh, and so with that, I would like to uh, give over to uh, Alfredo Soero from the University of Porto. I'm very happy to have you here and talk about um, validation of competencies from virtual, non-formal, informal learning. Um, and now the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Wolf, for the kind words. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I was a little bit late, but uh, I had classes and students have a test, so in the nearby hours, so it was not easy to, to <clears throat> finish. Anyway, um, I would like to thank Sandra for, for also for organizing this event and uh, Eden, of course, to have this uh, learning week. I think uh, it's going to be um, a very good repository of presentations for the future. That's at least for me. So uh, my presentation, my contribution is uh, something that we have done with the engineers. So it is mostly on the engineering side. And the project was coordinated by the German Engineering Association, VDI, or VDI. Um, and we had FEANI, which is the Federation of, um, of, um, of um, how do I say, uh, the engineer organizations in Europe. So it was a very participated um, uh, project. And the intention, like it is mentioned, is that uh, um, the one that is in the bottom, uh, validation of competences. Because engineers are very interested in um, uh, validating uh, uh, the profiles of other engineers that uh, not only those that travel, but also those that uh, work in each country or <clears throat> apply for a certain uh, qualification. So this is very important, as you know, and this is a topic of uh, today's seminar. It's something that uh, it's coming to life of everyone, uh, and engineers do not escape. So we tried to study uh, what uh, was already done in other uh, areas and in other projects, and this is what I've, I've, I've organized for this presentation. Um, I have... Um, uh, something on the relevance of lifelong learning and why we're doing this. As a matter of fact, I already said, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, what I wanted to say. And then I'll talk about uh, two other projects, the virtual, uh, virtual qualifications, it's, which was a project that uh, uh, tried to address the combination of virtual learning uh, plus uh, the qualifications of the European Qualification Framework and also the European the framework for the European higher education area. And I'll talk also about this specific project about um, engineers, uh, and um, I'll finish with some proposal or some ideas that we can discuss or, or address. So, trying to move. Okay, how do I move this? Okay, it's here. Okay, so the role of lifelong learning, I think that I mentioned uh, 
uh, have, there's a diversity of stakeholders that are interested in this question of uh, uh, validation of uh, what people learn in informal and non-formal uh, procedures. And um, in this case, um, uh, my uh, focus is precisely on the professional associations. Certain countries have uh, the profession regulated, some others don't. But in both cases, the engineers need to have some kind of uh, uh, verification of their uh, competition, comp competences and um, the updating of those uh, competences. Uh, uh, some countries also have mandatory uh, updating of the competences, like Britain and Ireland and Italy now. Uh, some others are voluntary, like mine. Uh, some others don't care, like the Swedish, like Sweden. So there are there is a variety of scenarios in Europe, but for all of them, from my point of view, for all of them, <clears throat> this topic is very important. So that's why I brought it here. Um, <coughs> Okay, I think we might have a technical problem. There is uh, no sound any longer. Um, we will see if that can be fixed. We are waiting just for some moments. Um, I cannot go on with the presentation. I'm uh, not the expert. So now it... Alfredo is on this topic. Sorry. Ah, now it's coming back. Now I'm back. You listen. Yeah. We hear. We hear. I don't know what happened. Yeah. Now you're back. Perfect. Yeah, I'm back. Perfect. So what so, I was saying is that, uh, and uh, two minutes have gone past, so I have to um, uh, speak quicker. Um, the 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 FEANI, which is this federation, is this engineering card where you record the initial studies, you record uh, the employment. And you also record the lifelong learning achievements. Um, and um, this is something that um, the professional engineer organizations use. As you can see, we have engineering education. We have um, the professional experience and the continuing professional development. So this is what is recorded for the engineers. And um, uh, how do you fit? virtual learning, like non-formal or informal learning, into this process. And that's what we study. Um, virtual, I don't know if Sander was a partner, I don't remember. Uh, but uh, this was a project where we tried to not only combine the virtual mobility, but the qualification frameworks, and um, having somehow common references for those that learn in different spaces and want their learning recognized in certain ways. So uh, there are some guides for teachers, organizations, universities. This is a relatively old project, but their principles are still valid from my point of view. Um, now for the one that we use for the engineers in terms of uh, non-formal and informal learning, um, and you lost my image, so I'm, <laughs> I'm going to share it again. Um, OK, there you go. Um, you, we have uh, tried to produce uh, European guidelines. One of the things that is in the recommendation of this project, uh, believe it or not, was a proposal for a European directive. We have European directives on so many things, and we propose an European directive on um, validation of non-formal and informal learning. Somebody has to put some order in what happens, and somehow uh, make it um, uh, more European. So that's one of the things that came out of this project. Another was uh, the creation of observatories. Um, there are certain organizations who record, like EDEM, EDEM has it, uh, UCAN also has it, observatories of this non-formal and informal learning with lots of materials that you can use. Um, and one of the things that we uh, underlined in the conclusions of the project is that we need evidences. You cannot measure, uh, then you cannot ensure quality. So you need to measure to have some quality. And in terms of uh, competences in this virtual environment, we need evidences. So we can measure 
what competences they acquired. Um, there were some proposals on how to present evidences. There is a project that you can see the error record. It was coordinated by the University of Cambridge some years ago, but it's still valid. So that's why we use it. CVs, uh, third party reports, of course, uh, uh, you need uh, somebody from the outside to make an evaluation. That was something that Baldi, the German engineer association, was very interested uh, in producing. And, of course, portfolios, mainly in portfolios to present the competences. So, um, um, the proposal is basically this. Like I said, for validation, we need four phases. Identification of the competences, documentation to provide the evidences, somebody has to verify it, and then somebody certify. So, basically, this is what is proposed in this project with the several steps, and um, we, never, we didn't invent anything. We just, like I mentioned, we took advantage of things that were done in the past by the different organizations. So, other things that are needed, and again, I'm talking about the engineering organizations. For the engineering organizations, you need to provide information, guidance, and counseling. Most of the engineers are not used to this, and I guess all the professionals uh, or students are not used to these uh, procedures yet. So this is something that uh, is needed. Of course, we need to work with stakeholders, for instance, the companies, the enterprises, of course, the universities, um, but um, or higher education institutions, but there must be a coordination. And there must be standards in terms of learning outcomes. We must be very strict on how do we write the learning outcomes so we can have a quality assurance, because anyone writes the learning outcomes of the training, either formal, informal, or non-formal, in different ways. And we need somehow some kinds of guidance. And again, the proposal for the direct, the European directive. And again, sorry for insisting, but I think that uh, uh, the academics and the professional organizations cannot get there. I mean, we need the commission to do something like they did with ECTS and uh, uh, the Erasmus and other uh, directives. So here is a list of references. I'm not going to click, but you have uh, lots of materials that we used uh, to produce uh, uh, this report from OECD to uh, the Euro Portfolio Project. We also provide some guidance, and you can. I think you'll have access to this uh, slide, so you can check and make your own conclusions. And that's what I wanted to say. I think I respected the 10 minutes. And um, glad to be here again. And thank you, Wolf, and thank you, Sandra, uh, for being here uh, and organizing all this. So, Alfredo, thank you very much. That was a very, very, very interesting presentation with lots of references. And I encourage everybody who's listening to uh, go to the references and have a look and uh, take benefit of that. Thank you very much, Alfredo, for the presentation, also for the timekeeping. Very, very good. <laughs> and um, I try. I as, try. We, as you can read in the chat to all the participants, as you can read in the chat, all slides, which you have seen here up to now and the ones we are going to show in a moment, all slides will be uploaded to the Eden's SlideShare account. Is SlideShare actually still existing? And the recording will also be made available. So um, you can have everything which you need uh, also afterwards for your own study. So I would like to invite some uh, questions. Uh, we have uh, three, four minutes. Uh, and uh, please, everybody, yes, type it. I answer verbally, right? To you, Nico? I answer verbally. Yes. Correct? Yes. And I would okay. like to ask so, all the participants to uh, just type uh, their questions into the chat, like Ildiko just did it. And um, now, Alfredo, please, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, the, the question of certificates also varies along very much, because, um, for instance, there are certificates uh, in certain engineering organizations where you need to have 40 hours, 60 hours per year or equivalent in terms of CPD. Otherwise, you lose your status. So the certificates somehow are indirect because you have the status of a chartered engineer, for instance, in Britain. Um, or, uh, for instance, like in my country, if you want to be uh, going for an upper level in the, in the 
association, you need to have a certain amount of CPD. You cannot progress without uh, uh, having a proof. So the certificate is indirect in these cases. Other certificates are, and that was what Vaudi was very concerned, they wanted certificates for specific topics. For instance, uh, I don't know, Wolf is German, so he may uh, say something, but our colleague Thomas Kiefer and Lars Fuld, they were interested in having, for instance, a certification on languages. So the engineers that were members uh, were going through a process of having um, uh, somehow proof that they could have um, proficiency in certain languages, and according to the levels, the Vaudi was then awarding the certificates. So the certificates vary a lot. Um, either they are used for professional recognition. For instance, one that is necessary, uh, it's, for instance, those civil, like in Greece, the civil engineers there need to be members of the association. Otherwise, they cannot uh, sign projects. That's a question of responsibility. So the certificate ensures that these people have the right qualifications to uh, build or design or uh, maintain uh, the buildings in, in Greece, buildings in other constructions. So it varies a lot. Thank you very much, Alfredo. Um, and uh, are they, are they, sorry, yeah, um, I'm also wondering if uh, the certificates are also electronic or do they receive paper certificates on with the institutional stamp or something? Yeah. The, the, for instance, in, in my home country, there is um, um, a program, which is called Valory, which is um, only to record your uh, progress in times of long, uh, lifelong learning, or CPD, or continuing education. And then they produce certificates which are electronic. You can download them, and you can use them, and you can show them in your portfolio, or on your Facebook, or whatever. You can show the certificate from the association saying these people have done so much, so they are up to date and they can ask for more money when they ask for payment for the services. Basically, that's what motivates engineers to have um, this uh, recognition of competence. Thank you okay? very much. Thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I think that um, we should move on to the second, to the next, to the third presentation. Um, and Ildiko, you have the chance to uh, phrase your question while speaking on your topic. Um, um, uh, sorry for, for uh, pressing on. Um, I think that no I think I that the issue of uh, validating learning, validating competencies, uh, Alfredo was now talking about will continue a little bit also in your presentation, Ildikurt. I think this is a topic which many of us are uh, working right. on, uh, actually. Oh, yeah. Um, so I'm very Fortunately. happy to, to have this uh, uh, presentation, which is coming up, which was prepared um, by two presenters, by Ildiko, of course, and by Anthony Camilleri. Um, but before I move on, I would like to thank you, Alfredo, again for your presentation and the materials which you sh shared with us. Uh, thank you very much. So now coming to the next, uh, the presentation is on open credentials. So you see we are staying with the topic of credentialing, uh, validating competencies, validating learning, learning, open credentials for open education, moving the needle forward, very interesting. Um, Ildiko uh, Maza is going to uh, present. Uh, she is uh, working at the Research and Development, um, uh, at the Knowledge Innovation Center, I'm sorry. She's working as Research and Development Associate at the uh, Knowledge Innovation Center. And she has also extensive work experience in the field of open and distance education and e-learning since more than uh, uh, 10 years. 20 years actually, um, and um, she is um, also in the field of innovative ICT solutions, facilitating uh, their um, uh, practical application also, which is the most challenging actually. And I'm very happy to have you here, Ildiko. Welcome to the presentation, and uh, now the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, Ulf. And uh, it really is a great pleasure to be back um, in the Eden Circle, uh, uh, my old family, uh, and uh, be sharing uh, some of um, uh, our recent work at the Knowledge Innovation Center. Uh, my questions uh, to Alfredo, of course, uh, were not entirely selfless because, as you will see, and Ulf also pointed out, my presentation uh, plugged in very well uh, to the thread uh, that was started by uh, Santara and uh, Irina and uh, continued by Alfredo. So let's see how much I can add to that uh, within the next uh, 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, I could talk so much more, so please try to keep me on time because I have a lot to say and I have very little time. Um, uh, my starting statement uh, will be something that you will all agree with, that education is, or at least should be, a public good. And uh, what I mean by that is uh, that um, there should be an open access to educational opportunities. Uh, we should be using as much uh, open educational resources as possible. And by this, empower students um, by the uh, provision of open educational practices. Now. Um, the typical process model for open education is, of course, we start with the open educational resources as the input. Uh, we have the open educational practices as the process. But what we come have uh, uh, coming out from the process at the end, the output, is something that is not uh, as widely uh, discussed as the, the previous two uh, stages. And uh, I'm very pleased that uh, the, the previous two presentations were discussing at uh, such length uh, the validation and the recognition, because I think what we have to agree on is uh, that the credentials coming out at the end of the open educational practices uh, also have to be uh, open and informative. Uh, what I'm going to uh, suggest is, uh, unfortunately, that the digital credentials are broken. And what I suggest are the problems uh, with digital credentials is uh, that, that they are not uh, really digital at the moment. That was one of the reasons why I asked Alfredo what the credentials they're issuing are. I'm going to describe every single one of these points a bit more in detail. There's limited access to underlying information. There's a lack of technical standards for uh, credential information. The standards that are available for security and verification, as I'm sure uh, our Lithuanian colleague, colleagues will agree, are very often closed. And uh, unfortunately, there's no aggregated credential data available uh, on um, these things. So what I mean by credentials still not uh, being fully digital is that, of course, there are digitized versions of uh, uh, paper-based certificates and credentials. But uh, the, the primary uh, medium of uh, providing credentials is still the paper-based uh, a certificate or degree, and the digitization at, at, at uh, most of the times is just uh, scanning a document and making that into a PDF, or in a better case, uh, it's, uh, uh, there's a digital uh, signature attached to that uh, to ensure its uh, verifiability. But um, as we will all agree, this is uh, not really <laughs> a digital credential. Uh, there could be a lot to improve on that. What I mean by the limited access to underlying information, if you recall the third point um, of uh, uh, Irina's uh, presentation, um, there should be underlying information, or no, it was the, the, the table um, presented by Sandra, uh, that when there is a, a whole a big table of the, the learning outcomes, the, the whole uh, learning plan, um, I, I argue that uh, when anybody would like to make an informed decision on um, recognizing credentials, uh, that underlying information is extremely important. Uh, if you take an, an ordinary certificate, and for the illustration of this point, I took a Coursera certificate. I participated in an online course uh, in 2017. Now, what I would like to prove with this, that although this is a Coursera certificate that was particularly issued by an online education provider, a big one, um, you will see that there's the verification link at the bottom right in the bottom right corner of this uh, certificate or this uh, document, but in fact it's not clickable, and uh, there is no information available um, on the screen or in the PDF that could lead anybody who would like to verify um, or or assess the content of uh, this certificate to learning outcomes or learning hours or learning plans anything. And that's without uh, 
even posing the, the possibility of forging such a certificate. If I'm good enough with the photo editing software, I could probably create a certificate like this uh, within a relatively short period of time. So, of course, I would use such a, a certificate anyway if I was uh, applying for a job. But uh, although we know that uh, most uh, uh, applicants for a job would uh, spend about three to four hours in preparing their application, we will see that 72% uh, of employers spend less than 15 reviewing each application. And that is a really, really serious mismatch. And basically what we come uh, to uh, at the end is that if the uh, employer uh, would have to take a lot of time to verify a credential, uh, and it more, takes more time than testing the skill itself, the credential is effectively worthless. And, and that's, that's my underlining point. So even if it has a beautiful watermark, uh, the document is not going to be uh, verified by the employer because they do not have the time. Um, also, um, just sticking with the uh, application for jobs uh, and coming to my uh, third point, uh, the lack of technical standards. Um, what I mean by the lack of technical standards is, of course, uh, employers use technology to, to screen applications for a job. But 62% of employers admit that some qualified candidates may be ruled out in their process because they are using unsuitable software and programs to narrow down um, or to filter out uh, the, the candidates with the highest potential, simply because uh, what they normally do is a very basic uh, keyword search. And some keywords may be missing from some applications. And that is really a pity. And again, disheartening for the applicants who spend so much time trying to apply for a job. Um, when it comes to standards for security and verification, uh, and that's also addressing the point of uh, forging uh, uh, documents uh, like uh, online or, or digital certificates, another unfortunate uh, uh, problem is that uh, the standards are, are closed and are provided by third-party institutions. And uh, I think we all agree that this is really unfair that if there's a relationship between an education provider and an individual who owns the credential at the end of the learning journey, they shouldn't be uh, going through a third party and pay um, additional amounts of money uh, to get that kind of electronic uh, verification so that they can uh, securely apply for jobs or get their certifications or uh, credentials. Uh, recognized uh, by another higher education institution if they study further or an employer. And my final fifth point was the non-availability of aggregated credential data. And my metaphor that I would like to use here is that even though you could uh, check the average star rating for uh, hotels in any European countries within a few clicks on booking.com or whatever software program or website you're using, the same information is not available on such an important uh, issue as the, the job market uh, demand and the education providing institutions supply on certain skills, competences, and qualifications. And that would be a hugely valuable piece of information for the institutions who are uh, trying to tailor their education provision but also individuals who are planning their career path or who would like to engage in uh, further education, get a second degree. So I think we all agree that this would be a very nice additional uh, data or, or um, side effect that we would have if we had more uh, really, truly uh, digital credentials available. So just to sum it up, Closed credentials are expensive and often very time consuming to acquire. If you, for example, would like to uh, get a, a supplement uh, diploma because uh, you lost the one that you acquired 20 years ago, uh, you would probably have to go through a lengthy procedure, pay a fee to an administrative department of your uh, former university, and wait until the, the document arrives to you uh, by career or anything. It's, it's not very convenient when you're applying for jobs that have very short and high deadlines. They are also very hard to use and share. As I said, if you just scan a document and, and send it as an email attachment, it's not really the same as a purposefully designed digital certificate. 
they also hinder open education. And this is this is the topic we're discussing. Everybody agrees that lifelong learning, continuing open education uh, via non-formal and informal uh, means, as well as uh, having patchwork uh, learning from several different institutions and online learning. So all those people who are advanced or unfortunate enough, like uh, migrants, who would have to take advantage of uh, credential transferability, um, they, they are locked out because of the closed credentials. So they are excluded and they would need them the most. And of course, closed credentials uh, could be abused by networks of intermediaries. Uh, and even uh, unintentionally uh, destroyed by the issuing uh, organization. So they're not really owned by the owner of the credential who did the learning. And the information not being available, the non-information does not inform policy at the end. <clears throat> but uh, there is a way to uh, more open learning to, to fix that uh, credentialing and make those open. So how do we disrupt or how could we disrupt credentials for the public public benefit? The good news is that we have all the pieces uh, available for an open credential system. We just have to be smart and strategic about um, um, utilizing them. And uh, the elements that I would like to highlight uh, are EU standards for qualifications. We are all familiar with the European qualifications framework. This gives an indication as to the level of the various qualifications offered by education institutions. The European Diploma Supplement provides a standardized template to give additional information about the degree. This is widely used by universities across Europe. ECTS, needless to say, again, uh, very widely used uh, by uh, European um, higher education provider institutions. Um, and the ESCO database, the European Skill Competences, Qualifications, and Occupations database, provide a standard terminology, although that is not used uh, by every um, European country, not to mention uh, widespread use by different uh, European institutions. Uh, the drawback, unfortunately, is, and that's what we have to work on and fix or try to add to, is that the uh, EQF is not applicable to non-formal education or micro-credentials. It just doesn't go to that small level of micro-credentials. Um, the European Diploma Supplement is strictly uh, related to degrees, again, not applicable to micro-qualifications or credentials. The ECTS, although it gives an amazing vocabulary and tool to describe uh, little uh, micro-granulates of uh, learning, uh, it's only applicable to higher education and not fully in qualification. And the ESCO database is actually not used at all by, by the, the former three, which is quite an interesting phenomenon considering that these are all EU standards. When it comes to the technical standards, um, of course you are aware that the technical standards do exist. For example, open badges. But what I would like to argue is that technical, the, the technical standards of open badges may be too open uh, to, be, to be useful for uh, a mechanism uh, like higher education. Another uh, system that exists is the national ID systems, and these could replace those uh, third-party companies uh, to be the sources of trust for signing. Now, the problem with that, even if you don't speak Slovene, this is a Slovenian example of the national ID system, but even if you did understand what this says, uh, you, can, you can tell that uh, this system is too complex to use for an average person, so practically not user-friendly. And what we do have is a very promising new technology, blockchain, that could also uh, facilitate the introduction of a decentralized system that would uh, uh, make the uh, third uh, intermediary partner redundant. But the problem with blockchain, although that's what we are uh, experimenting with, is that it's still extremely young technology. So we'll probably have to wait a few years before we can comfortably uh, say that this is something that we can apply to the big mechanism of European higher education. And when it comes to a global platform for uh, skill recognition, the sad truth is that this actually already exists. It wasn't an EU initiative. It's LinkedIn. But you can, or employers can, uh, filter out uh, potential job-seeking candidates by skills. But I think, again, all agree that it shouldn't be a single company who have a, have a monopoly on skills data 
it should be a, a collective public good again and open and accessible. So what we propose is that uh, an, uh, the elements of a system for open education credentials that should be realized are user, he user health credentials. So the credentials are in the hand of the, uh, the holder who, who uh, earned the credentials. They rely on open standards and open tax tech. They have independent verification. Maybe in itself, the, the, uh, the credential would be the source of verification itself. And we have heard uh, examples from the, the previous uh, presentations how this is actually possible to do. And that it produces uh, open app aggregation. And the two projects that I would kindly ask you to uh, keep an eye on, unfortunately, I won't have time to go into much detail um, uh, in what these two projects are doing, but I can share the links um, in the, oh, didn't, didn't work, uh, but I, I uh, shared the links to the, the two projects in the, the chat. One is called the OEPAT, and uh, this is to create a digital standard format for documenting open education credentials uh, based on ECTS. We just started piloting our so-called learning passport. And the other, maybe even more ambitious initiative, both of these projects are Erasmus Plus uh, projects, by the way, funded by the EU, is to create a model blockchain infrastructure for storing and automatically verifying credentials. And again, we have already kind of produced a minimum viable um, output, so we're in the process of internally testing um, how, how good it is for, for a little higher level of uh, testing. And then you can lean back, relax, and imagine a future where recognition is universal, automatic, and seamless, because that's what we are trying to, trying to drive this uh, uh, process towards. And to get back to my first slide, just to round the whole presentation up, uh, I'm suggesting that when it comes to the typical model of open education, we have the open educational resources as input, open educational practices as process, and we do end up with open educational credentials as the output along the lines I described uh, during the presentation. Thank you for your attention. And I, again, warmly invite you to check out the uh, web pages. Uh, there, there will be um, more information about the outputs we're working on and the public activities. Or get in touch with me. Here's my email. We will share the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, on the EDEN website, and it will be also on my slide share. So thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, I'm at your Thank you very much, Ildiko. A very, very impressive presentation. Uh, where the problems and the challenges we are facing are mapped out and worked out very, very well. And uh, you are also, or we are also working um, in these projects on solutions, uh, blueprints for solutions for that. Thank you very, very much. Um, very, very clear and impressive presentation. So um, there's one question in the chat from Francisca. She asks, there are, are there, no, there's a second one. Um, are there feedbacks on how employers recognize these certificates? I, I, I assume that uh, the question is, are there feedbacks on how employers recognize these blockchain certificates? That is one question. And the second question, we have only one and a half minutes um, for the questions, is from uh, Stefania. Um, hello, Stefania. Are you thinking of a wider framework, EU relevant, to be adopted by universities or of single universities establishing their own system? Eliko, can you answer to the questions and um, be very short? In one yeah. and a half minutes. <laughs> yes. Well, the to Francisca, uh, the, the certificates themselves uh, are uh, beyond our reach. So the, the certificates that are issued by the education providers will have to be uh, thoughtfully um, uh, created by the education providers. There's there's no shortcut to that. And um, remember my, my slide, just quickly go back to the, the five building blocks of uh, uh, an open credential find it. Until we have a, a comprehensive uh, a solution, uh, what I can suggest you to do, and this was uh, said before by my fellow presenters, 
use learning outcomes in your certificate, uh, use secure certificate, and avoid, avoid uh, proprietary certificate uh, software. And if you can ensure that, then your certificate will be informative enough. I think, and this is uh, just the, uh, we obviously cannot ask every employer, and there will be more advanced employers and less advanced employers. Alfredo can probably answer this question uh, uh, better because in engineers uh, tend to be more advanced. But I think what uh, would be the key is that within a few clicks, just like in open batches, you flip the pretty card and behind the, the, uh, the pretty face and the, the badge symbol, there will be a, a list of metadata. If your uh, credential is built up uh, properly, and this is something that the micro HE project is helping you with, we have a comprehensive metadata uh, standard, then your credential should at least allow the employers uh, to, to see what's behind uh, the underlying information uh, behind the credential. So they won't care about what the name of the university, but what the knowledge, skill, and content. Thank you. That's the uh, answer to the first question. Can you say in half a minute, but we really, really have to move on because we are already in the time of the last presenter. We have already cut off time from the last presenter now, right now at this very second. But can you maybe uh, answer to Stefania's question uh, in half a, half a minute or just? Yes, uh, Stefania, please uh, get in touch uh, with us through the, the contact form uh, of uh, uh, the micro HE website. Uh, the quick answer is that we, we are not providing a system that will be uh, used widely, but we will present a tool that universities, individual universities, will be able to test and use if they like. Thanks. It will be functional. So thank you very much. Thank you also for um, your questions, everybody. I quickly move on to the last uh, presentation of the day today. Um, we have a very stable attendance. Thank you for being with us uh, today in this uh, webinar session of the European Distance and Learning Week, uh, Distance Learning Week. Um, thank you, Ildiko, for your presentation. So the last presentation of today is um, carrying the title Online Learners Interactions and Engagement into Study Process. Um, it is done uh, by uh, Jedre, I hope I pronounced it right, Tamu Liune from Vitautas Magnus University. Um, Jedre Tamu Liune is uh, a junior researcher at the university working at international and national scientific and applied projects. Um, and she's mainly focusing, uh, he, she's mainly focusing on higher education and adult education. And I'm very happy to have you with us and to uh, be able to listen to your presentation. So the floor is yours, please. Hello. Thank you for inviting me to join this uh, webinar session. And uh, my presentation will be a bit more distinct from the previous ones and uh, very much uh, data driven. Uh, that will present uh, some case, let's say, of Vietnam uh, Magnus University. But I think it will um, help us to recognize and maybe confirm the gaps existing in the process of uh, digitalizing uh, learning achievements. So I'll share some facts and figures from the desk research that was conducted at Vitalis Magnus University, revealing basic information uh, regarding students' involvement into uh, online modules. This presentation will disclose uh, just the tip of the iceberg uh, regarding learners' behavior and engagement into online courses. Uh, I will, for the beginning, I will be brief uh, with overviewing uh, some main theoretical aspects that has been explored so far. And so results of research has disclosed that uh, interfaces between students' participation number of submissions to discussion forums, attendance of online lectures, and students' performance on their project assignments are very much significant uh, for students' success and achievement. While teachers' activities become significant as they no longer deliver uh, predetermined knowledge, but rather encourage learners to control their own learning process and construct their own uh, knowledge. Teachers' role changes from knowledge uh, deliverer to learning designer. And uh, recent research recognizes the con uh, 
significance of educational theory for this process, as there is a possible danger to imagine that numbers may speak for themselves without a need for a theory, as the researchers need theoretical cornerstones to step on in order to know how to interpret the results to, and make them actionable. So what data is important for us as uh, teachers and researchers at the new when we discuss the uh, students' engagement into online uh, uh, modules? At the moment, there are more than 2,500 modules on uh, the new Moodle platform. And as you can see, there has been a significant increase since 2012. And uh, it is so because Director's Order was released regulating and uh, encouraging teachers to upload the modules, to transfer them to, uh, onto Moodle. And uh, of course, not all Moodle uh, modules are delivered uh, fully online. Some of them are still face-to-face uh, -face or blended courses, but uh, they all must provide access to the learning uh, resources at least. As well, a high number of students, it is more than 5,000, uh, accessing online study modules prove uh, the need for an engaging uh, curriculum design and the, uh, at the same time demonstrate the potential variety of uh, different learners' uh, behaviors that teachers may face. So this chart demonstrates the uh, number of learners who access the new online learning platform from foreign countries each year. In some cases, these numbers might not seem so impressive, uh, but regarding the fact that in uh, 2011 there were students from 20 countries, in uh, the uh, six years later the number has increased uh, nearly six times. And these tendencies and increased need for a more open online uh, curriculum encourage university teachers to accept the challenges and prepare the course to be more open, flexible, and adapted uh, to different uh, learning needs. This is the log data, which shows uh, us as the teachers and researchers the approach to better understand the learners' behavioral patterns and interactions during different stages of the semester. Here we can see that learners are most active on Mondays, of course, most passive on Saturdays. Nevertheless, during the midterm uh, period, uh, num which is in October, number of active users increase quite a lot during the weekends as well. As well, the number of active users increases during the tasks, exams, and other activities for learners that are evaluated by teachers. And I would like to show you a bit more let's see, detailed uh, patterns of learners' behavior. Um, this, lay, uh, this learners' behavioral flow chart illustrates learners' interaction and engagement it presents overall uh, number on, and trends of interactions on Moodle and is not related to any specific module. Uh, this reveals that after logging in, nearly 20% of learners drop out from Moodle platform. And uh, we were wondering why. So we thought that the assumptions were that maybe they want to remind themselves of the password or they want just to show their last uh, sign-in data teachers. Those who don't drop, uh, drop out after the, uh, the first interaction, 80% of them uh, tend to drop out after entering the module page. We can assume that those students aim to check if there is any new information uploaded in the course. Uh, with the first click, learners spend uh, time checking forums, assignments, and other folders. Learners' engagement into forums is confirmed by the fact uh, that 90% of all sessions aim to, towards forums and 75% uh, of learners move from the course to the assignment page. And the following data confirms uh, the basic principle of Internet users' habits that they quit after the first click. In our case, 24% of uh, learners quit after the fourth click. They've checked the, they have checked all the overall course information, discussion on news forums, uh, assignments and uh, that's it. This data discloses the tendency the, when learners who tend to spend the more time and have more than four interactions demonstrate lower dropout rate and is more or less uh, equally distributed among different activities as there is no significant difference in uh, dropout rate from the fifth step. 
This behavior may be related to learners' motivation to study and search for more information. Those uh, who aim for more knowledge and in-depth uh, uh, understanding of the subject spend more time analyzing uh, course content. Moreover, this demonstrates that uh, students tend to access uh, the most recent lecture information rather than the overall course material. This data should help teachers to understand preferred learning patterns and develop course uh, content based on that. If we look at this uh, from the other point of view, uh, the previously presented tendencies uh, or trends of learners' engagement with the Moodle platform and learning content correlate with the fact that since 2012, there has been a significant growth in number of assignments and forums in online study courses. Learners' engagement into forums and assignments show that they are engaged into active, active tasks and those that are evaluated and assessed by peers or teachers. Moreover, uh, teachers aim to integrate more motivational tools uh, helping to assess, observe, uh, empower and uh, students' learning process and at the same time encourage them to engage more actively into uh, course activities. The most recent system that we uh, have integrated is the uh, digital badges. Uh, they have been introduced to, to the MU less than half a year ago and uh, Though since then, there were around 500 teachers rewarded with, uh, those, with digital badges uh, based on their module opening. And uh, it is nearly 70% of all uh, VMU teachers. And we believe that uh, this demonstrates uh, high quality of online courses because uh, to get the badge uh, for the course uh, openers, uh, it has to be assessed uh, by the expert team who what is the, the module? Uh, so 23, oh, the number has gone. 23 experts uh, have been awarded for their continuous input uh, into quality assurance of online modules as well. They received digital badges. And so far, six study courses uh, from the field of social sciences uh, provide the badges uh, for students who, uh, uh, who are active uh, in discussions participation in forums, and implement, in, implement additional tasks. Despite the ongoing progress and improvement of online modules, uh, the, in many occasions there is a gap between uh, knowing that a certain variable about learners' behavior is significant and knowing how to act upon it to encourage their engagement uh, into study course. And this is a, a very short uh, look at the, the research uh, which is uh, done recently at the moment uh, regarding the new teachers' approach towards the uh, use of learning analytics data for their practice improvement. So total number of responses present opinions of a very small part of uh, teachers as the questionnaire is still open and not all of them have finished filling it yet. But the most optimistic and inspiring part for us as uh, researchers is that uh, teachers are willing to learn. They understand the uh, usefulness of, uh, of uh, learning analytics and the data they can use for their course improvement. They uh, want to analyze this data and uh, work with it in order to improve their curriculum. And this gives us hope that uh, analysis of learners' and behavior, interaction, or engagement will become part of each university teacher's uh, practice, as well as learners will be aware that they, cannot uh, that they can monitor their own learning participation and engagement, uh, control the risk of uh, failure, and uh, reach uh, for their own goal learning goals. Thank you. Thank you very, very much for the presentation. I found that is a real interesting data which you, that are real interesting data which you presented there. Uh, also in a very, very interesting way to look at it and to analyze it. These um, pathways uh, in a way through, through the, the content. Uh, thank you very much.
for your presentation. A very, very well understandable uh, presentation. I would like to um, encourage participants uh, now to uh, ask questions. Uh, and um, that can be directed to uh, uh, to the last presenter, to Jedra, or also to other presenters, if you like, um, which are still in the room. And um, meanwhile, I think we have two or three minutes left. Uh, here are they all again back. So um, meanwhile, uh, we're waiting if somebody has a question or a comment. I would like again to thank all of you very much for your time and your presentation from all over Europe. Uh, we are here uh, and it has been a very, very good um, session uh, with really interesting and very fresh data, fresh projects and excellent results, which you can also remember the first presentation by Irina and Sandra can use for your own university processes. So take benefit from that. Thanks to all of you. Um, and one thing I would like to uh, say uh, and not forget is that you can receive a badge for this for, for taking part in this session. If you haven't registered to the webinar and wish to receive an open badge, you can register uh, at the link which is now displayed by by the Eden Secretariat. Thanks to the Eden Secretariat also for the uh, setup hosting uh, of the of the webinar and all the absolutely excellent support. That's uh, really uh, absolutely noticeable that you have a lot of experience in this. Very very well done. Thank you very much. Uh, very flexible support. Yeah, and with that, I would like to um, uh, say my last point, and that is. The, e -learning, uh, the European Distance Learning Week is continuing tomorrow and the next days. Check out the schedule uh, and um, there are more interesting uh, webinars coming up tomorrow and uh, during the whole week, uh, sometimes one, sometimes two a day. Uh, and I think uh, now uh, on behalf of, of Eden, of the organizers, I would like to uh, wish you a nice day. Thank you for your participation. Thanks again to all the presenters for the presentations. And um, the session is being recorded, so you can come back to that uh, and uh, find it in the archives. The slides are going to be uploaded. Thank you very much. And see you online or offline, wherever, next time. Thanks.